Let's just do the four limitless contemplations. May all beings have happiness and create the causes of happiness. May they all be free from suffering and creating the causes of suffering. May they find that noble happiness which can never be tainted by suffering. May they attain universal impartial compassion free of worldly bias towards friends and enemies. Sem jen dam je dewa tang dewe ju tang den pa ju tik dungal tang dungal chichu tang tra wa ju tik dungal me pe dewa tampa tang mindra wa ju tik nearing chak tang ni tang tra we tang nung chen po la ni pa ju tik. So good morning, everybody. Sorry about being a little bit late today, but we'll catch up, I'm sure. Um. I've called today's talk, just to carry on, of course, with the copper-colored mountain, but seeing with inner pure vision the outer features of the copper-colored mountain. It's such an important topic, because if you can understand it and what I've been just talking about, about how everything in this whole world is upside down, inside out, from the weather to the nations, to the fighting, to the terror, to everything, it's all upside down. And the point of the matter is, the only way you can do it is to purify your inner vision, how you see things, because things are not as they seem to be. And Jamcom Control gives a beautiful quote. He says, being see the purity of the realms in which they dwell, according to their own levels of inner purity. According to their own levels of inner purity. But the realms themselves are pure from the very beginning. Now ponder this. If the realms are pure, why is it that we aren't seeing? What is the meaning of this for me? And you can give me your interpretation with pleasure. As soon as you realize this, you feel, you know, as soon as you feel miserable in your life, which happens to all of us about yourself, your own situation, what's happening in the world, you stop for a moment in that moment that you're feeling miserable. Instead of pointing it all to, I feel so miserable, you actually stop and you begin to ponder that my mind is a mirror, that's all it is, that reflects everything going around me. So it's very important because collective minds reflect collective situations. So your own mind reflects the situation of your own life. But co collective minds reflect what's going on, the wars, the hatred, the I want your territory, I want your people, I want this, I want that. So if you start training to see that if this world is the world of a Buddha, if a Buddha is running this world, okay, then there must be purity in it that you can't see. So train your mind, which I'm going to tell you how, to at least get glimpses of this purity. Because we are at the, remember what I told you in that one verse, we are at the level of Varishana's mind, and because, sorry, mind into his heart. And if we are at that level, it means very special teachings are available to us because it's a pure Buddha's land. Varishana is right in the middle of everything and his mind links to our universe, our world, our everything, which means that it's all available now. And so it's a really, really special thing. So how do you get to do this? I'm laughing because, you know, last week when I was giving you the teaching and everything, so my guy who's in India doing the monlams and everything, he thought that part four that I did last night, last week, was the bee's knees. 
So it just centered everywhere. I said to him, how can you send part four? You've got to have part one. He says, no. And with it, he sent it. He was having lunch with all Zongsa, Kienzi, Rinpoche's, um, their, their, you know, their Siddhartha intent group and everything. He was having lunch with them. And then they asked him, Zongsa, Kienzi wants to know if, they, if South Africa's got teachings. So he just sends it to them, my teaching philosophy. I said, do you really want to get me into trouble? Okay. He said, no, your explanation on the Middle East was excellent. I sent it to all my family in America. I sent it everywhere. You know, I just, that's why I didn't want her to ever put it on YouTube. But I thought, well, it is what it is. But when you look at where we at at the moment, and I can't help my enthusiasm for this teaching, because it's really, really, really such important teaching. And if you can switch on, if you haven't got low cheating, you could switch on your thing. I like to see how you actually deal with it. But how do we get our minds to start seeing glimpses of purity when we look at the ugliness in the world? How do we stop? and actually get a glimpse of what it really is. Not our perception, but what it really is. Because sometimes awful things happen because of the karma of a group of people or the karma of a nation or the karma of an individual. When we know that nobody's in the wrong place at the wrong time, then we have to have a trust, at least if we've got these teachings, that there's no one there and nobody's in a such miserable situation they don't need to be in. That miserable situation is when you say to yourself, listen, now I have to put down all my burdens of rubbish, all my unmitigated drivel. I have to put it by the side and I have to take myself into a Buddha being you know, when people criticize me, I would get so upset before. Now I just throw it over. I'm getting on with whatever there is that has to be done. So first of all, how do you start seeing purely? Number one, you study teachings like this. And I know some of you are really studying very hard with it. Number two, you meditate and contemplate on them now because they're here today, gone tomorrow. And thirdly, you do practice every single day, half hour, five hours, one hour, I don't care, just regular. And when you're doing your practice, you know, when I'm learning this stuff of the Copper Colored Mountain, now I read this book so carefully and I cannot believe I'm coming slowly to the end of all the notes I'm writing for you. I promised myself to write about maximum 10 pages of notes and I'm now on number 22 okay so I'll have to cut down on what I said because it's so precious I, I have to write it down then I read it up again and again and again but you really have to do the practice and then you go oh I'm reading the English of my practice and then I go my goodness I never realized that I just never realized that. You suddenly wake up and you realize that luminosity must dawn as wisdom. That means whatever you're able to see that is pure must become wisdom. Wisdom is central to you. And I want to teach on a Tuesday night them to throw the wisdoms around and really understand how they relate to this human body. And this teaching gives it to you, okay? And cleanse that mirror with practices like Vajrasadva, like all of those cleansing things, chur, the little chur practices you can do. Cleanse the mirror. And that's another point. And another point is prepare for death. Don't think that's a negative thing. Actually say to yourself, okay, let's say tomorrow morning. I'm in a car accident and I die. Or I'm old and I don't wake up from my bed. What am I going to be doing? Make up your mind what you have to be doing. Know where you have to go. My husband mocks me. He says, you think you've got a map of the afterworld. And then I go, I do have a map of the afterworld. Okay. He says, where is it from? I said, never mind. 
You don't need the map. I've got the map. I know exactly where I'm going. And I'll keep on reinforcing that and learning more and more. It's very important. I don't care how he mocks me about it. It doesn't matter. Let your family rather complain. You're so involved in your spiritual things. You don't give us enough time. You're busy with spiritual matters. Then you know you're on the right track. If you're busy with everything in your life, 24 7, then Bob's your uncle, you're not on the road, okay? You're somewhere in samsara, in the illusion, in the impure thing. And really, one instruction from this book is this, and then I promise I'm going to go straight on to the real teaching and do them very quickly because I can't do the detail. It will take us. Never mind this year, the whole of next year as well, because it's so profound. It's all your internal stuff. And then I begin to see it in my own practice, because I like to always read about the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. And then I realize, oh my God, in the peaceful and wrathful deities, there are these six Buddhas standing on lotus flowers. And who are they? They are the Buddhas of each of the six realms. If, if there's a Buddha of each of the six realms, the hell realms, the hungry ghost, the jealous God, etc., then it means they're pure. We just can't see it. Once there's a Buddha, it means somebody with an enlightened mind is putting their light over it. Remember that. And in this book, there's one instruction. It goes like this. And I'm reading it slowly. I should actually have it on the screen. One's fixation. One's fixation on form. On your form, which includes your house, your everything that goes together with form. One's fixation on form is purified through the contemplation of the external Mandala of the palace of lotus light. That's the copper colored mountain or Zangbo Paldri. Zangdo Paldri. If you look at that statement, as soon as you have that connection, it's not to a person called Guru Rinpoche. Okay, Guru Rinpoche is the near Manakaya level. If you want, there's Padmapani in the prayer, that's Chen Rezi. And if you want, there's Amitabha or Samantabhadra, that's Amitabha. They all one. One is just a manifestation from the Dharmakaya. That's all you're looking at. So when you start not seeing Guru Rinpoche as, you can see him as a father if you need a father or you need somebody to help you. I often do and I go, Guru Rinpoche, help me with this, help me with that. But actually in the end, I'm talking to myself because this whole prayer, this whole thing is the mandala of the palace of lotus light. And where is the palace of lotus light? Is it over there? Can you get a map? Is it out there? Can you get a map? Is it in India? Is it in Odiana? No, it's right here. It might manifest in areas of the world. That's why Echo Rinpoche said to the people in Zimbabwe, he said to, what's his name? That, um, that Sangoma, I can't think of his name now. But he said to him, do you have a copper colored mountain in Africa? And one of them said, yes. There is a particular mountain that is copper colored. And it's in Akon Rinpoche's book. It's everywhere. Just when you open your eyes. So once you connect with the mandala of the palace of lotus light, your fixation on form, on things, on how things are going is dropped immediately. Avril, do you understand what I'm saying? I want to know if you do. Tell me if you do, because I, I, I tell you often to really, really look at that. It's absolutely amazing, but absolutely amazing. When you see that, I don't know if anybody wants to say anything. We're going to go on to the verses. But do you understand what I'm saying? Zangdok 
Palri or the copper colored mountain is unveiled through a symbolic prism. So the symbols that you're reading in the prayer is symbolic prism. We need to overcome our reliance on language as a sole means of validating the truth of ordinary experience. The less intellectual we are, the better. So when we get something, even though we don't fully understand it, that doesn't matter. If you have a relationship with it, when we do the symbols that are, are in this palace, in this copper-colored mountain, when we learn the symbols, those are your own symbols. That's how you awaken. That's how you get a body of light. Every single feature of your physical, psychological, psychophysical components of your physical body are all absolutely when turned around enlightened aspect of your body of light which when you die if you give up the fixation on the form then you are automatically into the body of light you can start seeing things as they are it's so exciting every time i lean forward then i think of him sending my things to other people and they think who's this lunatic you know, with all her enthusiasm I love it I absolutely love it what else can I say to you I love it you know it's it's such wonderful wonderful material and then it tells you every single thing every single feature of your ordinary body is completely and totally an enlightened feature and you all understand that. Now, last week, we were talking about the four sides of the temple made out of the four things. And then I explained to you, those are four of the five wisdoms. Those are the colors of the Buddha families. And then in the middle is the light one, the, the, the plain white one. Okay, and each of them have got activities that you do. Imagine if we had the enlightened activities of subjugation. Imagine if we could just fly to the Middle East and subjugate all the dark forces and find a solution to their problems. I mean, I'd love to be able to do that. And prosperity and power and all these things are all in the symbols of the palace. And now when you go back, because I've started to read this prayer every day, at the end of my practice. It has added another five minutes to my practice, which just makes me later for everything else. But anyway, it's too amazing because when you study it and then you read the prayer, you begin to understand yourself. You begin to understand exactly what it all means. It's so important. So, we were talking about that, and now we come to stanza five. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, but you must interrupt if you want to say, Karen, you included, whatever you want to say or ask. Don't, don't think, oh, well, I can't ask it, because it's really important that you actually understand these things. When they say it's translucent, like a rainbow, the five wisdoms are paired with the five Buddha families. And in their union, those five Buddha families, in their union, they, they represent the emancipated aspects of our psychophysical complex. The five wisdoms are paired with the five aggregates, the five elements. They all, they all paired with them. So as soon as you're looking at, for example, consciousness and I'm going to teach this on Tuesday night so if you can't come try and get it but if you take consciousness consciousness our ordinary consciousness is turned into primordial consciousness how by the wisdom mirror-like wisdom of the Vajra family shows us the truth of anger and hatred 
And that transforms our consciousness into primordial consciousness. So you learn those five aggregates, forms, feelings, your feelings. If you are not looking at your feelings as something terrible, tangible, I'm depressed, or I'm, 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 I feel angry, or I feel jealous, or I feel whatever. If you look at those, and you suddenly hold up the mirror of your mind, you realize each one is associated with a different aggregate. So Ratna Sambhava, who is the wisdom of equality where all beings are equal, is actually linked up with the feelings of the skandhas, of the aggregates. Because if you could see, if you could see that most of your feelings are where individuals feel like you inferior to me, this job is not for me, and then you get all these ugly feelings that happen in you. And with the wisdom of equality and Ratna Sambhava, it's all transmuted into its real, clear aspect. Now you have to play with this. It's like a bag of beads. You have to play. I've been playing with it for years and years and years and years and years, doing the mantras, looking at it from every aspect of what my physical body is and what it really means, and putting them all together. You have to do the work for this. And then one day, boom, you get it. You see it. Even if it's only a death, you suddenly realize it. Evie and I had a discussion last week, and she says, what if she doesn't really understand all the things that I'm saying? What if she doesn't understand all the concepts and ideas? I go, I don't care a damn. Your heart is full of devotion and dedication. That's enough. Okay, I need to know these things backwards, forwards, sideways, because I need to teach them to people. But if you've got devotion and dedication and regular practice and love and service to beings, you're okay, trust me. Okay. Anyone want to say anything, please, or ask anything with pleasure. Because you know what? You're all very quiet, but I know you're concentrating. And I'm very happy with that. But I don't want anybody to go away and say, I didn't understand this, I didn't understand that, or this is my opinion about that. You're welcome. You can butt in. I'm no authority. I just study like a Trojan. That's all. Now, yes, please. I, you know, when I met Lama Yeshi, I spoke to him and I said to him, I'm quite concerned. My father's got very advanced Alzheimer's. When he dies um, on his deathbed, what's going to happen? And he said, You don't have to worry because his true Buddha nature is not messed up, it's exactly. totally pure. And everything that's muddled in his mind now, falls away and he'll be in the purity. And we got to believe that. And not only do you have to believe that, but you know what I tell people who've got family that's got Alzheimer's? My best is to talk to an Alzheimer's patient because they have a much better idea of truth than we do. Because if you look at them, you know Rachel Raymond's wonderful story of this woman who never said two words for the last 10 years. She just sat looking out of the window. And Rachel Raymond was a student at that time. And then she turned to her just before she had to play beads with her. The woman was about as interested in playing beads as a medical student, as the man in the moon, or maybe she was still at school, I'm not sure. And then and then, right at the end, you weren't allowed to question the patients, but she actually said to this woman who hadn't spoken for all the years, can I ask you what you're doing? She was a cheeky little girl. Can I ask you what you're doing? And the woman turned to her and said, why, child? I'm looking at the light. Now think about that, okay? 
the most wonderful story because they've left the whole deluded world behind. And we say they deluded, but actually they've left the deluded mind behind and they actually are fully focused on their thing. And if you talk, I promise you, I told you with my aunt, I talked to her about death and dying and where you go. And she was also, occasionally she'd say a few words to people. But when I finished talking to her, I said, Auntie Sheila, we called them auntie, you must be tired. And she said to me, oh, no, baby, this is absolutely exquisite. Okay. So what I was talking about was at her level of mind, which was free of all the crap that we tied to. Think about this, all of you. Right. It's so important because what are we preoccupied about? It's unbelievable. So thank you for that. It's a very important thing what you say. And this teaching gives you the full picture of who you are. If you just read it again and again and again, one day you will look at one of the verses and you'll say, oh, that's what I'm doing all the time. And I find it absolutely fascinating. And sometimes in the morning, early morning, when I'm reading it, I go, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I've just realized. Now, when I come to tell you what I've just realized, I haven't a clue, I can't remember anymore because so many things have happened to interrupt me. When you're demented, nothing interrupts you because your mind is there all the time. But of course, you have dementia of a lot of people that, you know, that are, are, are still concentrating in the past of their fixations and everything. But certainly if a person has, has got some kind of light and some kind of thing. They understand these things and you can tell them in a depth. You can really talk them through and help them a lot, a lot, a lot. They're absolutely tuned in. So let's go to stanza five. Quickly, Burn, if you could put it on the ornaments of enlightenment. What's beautiful in this book is that they give each thing, each sentence, each stanza has got a, a heading, which is really, really, really beautiful. Further on, Burn, I think we only, oh, wait, a little, uh, yeah, that's fine. Burn, it's a pity you haven't got the headings, but the heading, the heading of stanza five is actually um, ornaments of enlightenment. That's the heading. And I found when you've got the, the heading, it's really very helpful. Because just what I've been saying as we read it, what I've been saying is when you ask, why do I need to understand the ornaments in the description of the palace? It's so important because we have all these aspects, these qualities within our true nature. And it's all transformed instead of being thickened into the coarse body. It's called the alchemical conversion of the elements of the physical body and transformation into a body of light. So let's read that, that one, number five, called Ornaments of Enlightenment. Courtyards, corners, paintings, and sculptures swirl in the colors of a rainbow. Remember, they swirl in the color of a rainbow because they're pure perception, always the color of a rainbow. Streamers with attractive qualities and beams with hanging garlands and pendants Water spouts, balconies, door ornaments and arches, the wheel of dharma and parasols, all are perfect in sign, meaning and symbolism. May we take rebirth in the glorious copper-colored mountain. So just briefly with that, thanks, Boone. You can take it off now. Just very, very briefly with that beautiful thing. Every feature of the ornaments of the palace is perfect in meaning, sign, and symbolism, drawn from the vast repository of Buddhist doctrines and practices. 
Lots have to do with the features listed in the 37 factors of enlightenment. Now, there's, there's a very big teaching called the 37 factors of enlightenment. You can Google them. It's, you can, you'll get them, I'm sure, if you actually Google it. Okay. And each of them are part of those 37 factors. For example, when they describe the four inner courtyards, that symbolizes, the four inner courtyards symbolizes the four bases of mental power which are, if you look in the teaching, your intention, your diligence, how much effort you put into things, your attention, whether you can actually keep your attention in every way, and your critical investigation. Critical investigation is very, very important because critical investigation means when you look at something, you challenge it, you ask your questions. That's what the Buddha taught. Don't just accept what I'm saying. Critically evaluate. So those four bases of mental power are all in the ornaments of the of the the um the palace, all acquired and perfected on the Mahayana path of accumulation. You know, the first step, if any of you did your Mahamudra, is accumulation, then joining or union then seeing when you can really start seeing things, that's when everything starts changing for you, then meditation, and then no more learning. Those are all in the, those pathways are all in the copper-colored mountain, and then to a higher level, and then to a higher level. Okay, it's very important. They all become qualities of enlightenment. The four sides of the palace are four applications of mindfulness or awareness. That's what they represent. Every detail of the lotus life palace, regardless of how small or insignificant, lends itself to a creative range of interpretations. The door ornaments, the four door ornaments on the door, they represent the four immeasurables that we all say. May all beings of happiness and create the cause. May they be free. From That's on the door of the palace, which is loving kindness. May all beings be have happiness and create. Loving kindness, compassion. May they be free from suffering and creating. Sympathetic joy. May they all, etc. And equanimity. May they all be beyond that. Those four are all represented on the palace. Every single Buddhist teaching is represented in the palace. Don't you think that's unbelievable? I mean, you can go and read up and whatever, however far you want to go. I can't go into the four arches in the temple. They represent the body's two eyes and two ears. The wheel of Dharma that is there, one of the eight auspicious symbols, represents Buddha's first symbol, first uh, sermon on Sarna on the four noble truths. And it means to overcome samsara's inherent dissatisfaction. It's right there, the wheel of Dharma. And that represents the Buddha's first sermon on suffering and how it works. Okay. And Chikma Lingpa says, every feature is perfect in meaning, sign, and symbol. That's all I'm giving you from that verse because you can go and read it up. If you've got the book and you've got it on your thing, you can go and read up what everything represents if you want to. And if you don't, it doesn't really matter. All I want you to do now is to understand that everything on the palace is there to represent something inside of us. So every step of the way, this could just be, I could not call it the copper colored mountain and I could call it teaching the Buddha Dharma, an overall view. And then, you know, nobody would get their knickers in a knot that I was teaching the copper-colored mountain. But the point of the matter is, that's what it's about. It's about seeing it and then seeing that it's in your heart. And when it's in your heart, what does that mean? It means that you have all of that in your body of light, your Vajra body has that heart, and in that heart, you have all of these things. So 
So let's go to stanza six, unless anybody wants to say anything. Let's go to stanza six, Boone, which is called A Moment of Heaven on Earth. I must ask all of you, when was your last moment of heaven on earth in the lake, lakey? Probably not beautiful. Thank you. So let's read this stanza. Here, among wish-fulfilling trees and springs of nectar, lavish pastures of medicinal herbs and landscape, permeated by sweet fragrance, sages and vidyadharas, as are the knowledge holders, and various birds and buzzing bees transmit in songs the teachings of the three vehicles. May we take rebirth in the glorious copper-colored mountain. So I've only done a little, a little um, bit on this, but let's, thanks, Boone. Try and understand here the beauty of a pure land. And don't see it outside, see it inside, the beauty of a pure land. Our lives on earth are actually like this, because this is Buddha Shakyamuni's pure land. But we don't have the vision to see with pure perception. We can only see with coarse perception. So we have to take the purity of the copper-colored mountain and try and apply it internally over and over again, like the water in the copper-colored mountain, there's abundance of water. Pristine. Sure, I would love that, to take it from the tap or the thing. Pristine. Sustains life. Therapeutic nectar that cures all illness. Crystal clear. Cool. Sweet. Soft. Soothing. No impurities. Beneficial to your throat. Sounds good. Sounds much better than a whiskey, <laughs> which I can't drink out, even if I try. It's absolutely pure. It absolutely cleanses everything in you. Now, your body is how much percent water. So if you think of the water flowing through you, giving you good health. You know what I was thinking about? I was thinking, you might. this might sound crazy to you. But this is what I was thinking in my link to the mandala of Guru Rinpoche. I was thinking, you know, if I need to leave this earthly body soon, then it's absolutely fine. Then I'll just go straight to Guru Rinpoche and I'll just straight away manifest everywhere and teach wherever I want to. But if it is very beneficial for me to stay for another whole lot of years, then I need to regenerate this very tired, haggard body, okay? I need to regenerate. And I thought to myself, is that possible? And then I thought, yes, of course it's possible because all these features are inside you. So if you changed your whole perception and your whole body, wouldn't it regenerate your body? I've seen these masters, some of these masters, get younger. As they get older, they get younger because they are developing the real qualities of the body of life. Now, I don't even have that much power to do that, but if I need to, well, maybe I can, you know, because if there's still a lot that I've got to do, then they've definitely got to regenerate this very tired physical body. You know, I mean, it's, it's necessary. So you start you start perceiving things differently. You don't see yourself as old. You see yourself as, as having more knowledge and wisdom to be able to do what you need. Why would I need a young body to do that? A young body would never be able to understand all of this yet. So I was thinking about that. You can ponder it. But anyway, all the things, a life, enhancing environment every living being from the sages to the insects transmutes transmits the dharma the truth of all life an unceasing sound of the dharma now all i could say to you is when you start to hear this in the true perception of the buddha shakamuni's land that we live in 
it's the sound starts to become intensive. It's like, you know, when you hear those cicadas going, you start to hear it. And then if you listen much deeper, you'd hear all the mantras going. It's such an amazing thing when you really look at it. It's absolutely amazing that you look at your whole life as you hear the sounds when my doggies bark, I've got to start saying, no, it's not an, a loud bark that jolts me out. It's a loud proclamation of the Dharma. It's just a completely different way of looking at everything. And all the beings in this pure land discourse effortlessly. They talk about the Dharma. They interact with each other. Okay, And melodiously teachings of the three vehicles the Shravakayana or the Hinayana, which is the, the rigorous monastic effort, ethics. So some of them are really saying, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to follow this rule, that rule, the other rule. And lots of them are in the Mahayana, that's the rigorous monastic ethic. In the Mahayana, it is altruism, awakening for the sake of all beings. Now it's so interesting because Zonsa Kiensi in this, in this um, Monlams in India, he really, a lot of the teaching is on bodhicitta. And a lot of us don't really know what bodhicitta is. But bodhicitta is awakening to be able to give service of all kinds to all sentient beings, which most of you have that in your life all the time. And it's really, really important because it's awakening for the sake of all beings, not just because you want to be a powerful person or anything like that. It's awakening because every suffering person, you know, when I look at the ants in my bath or all the little insects, I always have a hand shower in the morning and a proper shower in the evening and I have a hand shower. And then when I come to look in the bath, they're all these little ants. If you touch them, they're trying to get away because they have the motive to stay alive. So you think about them with their Buddha nature and you remove them from the bath, even if you are in a hurry. You remove them from everywhere. So it's really important to see this. And the Vajrayana, which is considered the, the quintessence of the practice where you are engaging directly with the primordial nature of mind, and many methods to liberate sentient beings. So it goes from the rules and regulations and ethics to the altru for yourself and to make yourself an arahat, free yourself from it, to the, the teachings of Mahayana, which are the altruism for the benefit of all beings, to Vajrayana, which is available to us since the Buddha sent Guru Rinpoche into the world, which is where we can liberate sentient beings and liberate ourselves and start to see ourselves in a completely different way. So that's all I'm doing on a moment of heaven and earth. You can go and read up those that are interested. Any question, any comments, and I think we should do a meditation. We'll just do Dajam Rim. Chigdal Yeshi Dorje's quote, and then we'll do a little meditation. Anyone want to ask or say? You're welcome, really. Nice. But anywhere you hear, which must be you must be getting something from, from my, my, my teaching of some way. And that's all I care about. I don't mind if you don't say anything, but if you feel something, say it, because I'm trying to make this, this Monday morning, very precious to me. And, um, and it's really a wonderful way for us to change our whole lives and see our lives as completely different, especially during war times and the worrying that this war could actually extend to involve a world, you know. All right, then I just want to say one thing and then we'll do the meditation. The next stanza, 7 to 14, is called the three levels, which I've just mentioned now, three of them, the three levels of the lotus-like palace. 
Now, these three levels are so vital to us. And then when it goes 14 to 19 or however many there are, then you go on to the esoteric meditations. So this tells us who we are. And then the esoteric meditations blows my mind out of, the, out of its heart, out of its skull, because it touches something so deeply. This is still explaining lots of things to you but you still need to touch it if you're going on this path of enlightenment. But I read this quote to you, I'm reading it again, Dajom Yigral Yeshi Dorje says, if you want to establish the teachings, make them reside in your mind, and your mind is in your heart. In the depths of your mind, you'll discover the Buddha, and it's important, if you're going to look for pure lands, if you're going to look for pure lands, purify your attachment for the deluded and ordinary. You know how attached we are to the deluded and ordinary, okay? And then delightful pure lands lie right beside you, right in you. So get rid of your attachment to the ordinary, you know, when we're going to do Netflix or watch something, I, I look at the titles and then I'm only interested in those that are a little bit mystical, a little bit Asian, a little bit different, a little bit unusual. Then it interests me. These other things don't interest me at all. And I told you I do that while I do other things. So it doesn't really matter to me. But the point is I love it. When they're mystical, when I'm watching somebody's mind who's got some interesting movie that really touches a core in me rather than the rubbish about relationships and all of that. And you know what? It's so important that you don't, you, you purify your attachment for the deluded and the ordinary. Because it's so interesting. I think, Gail, you can understand that with your partner of a very long time. And I can understand that of my partner of a very long time, okay? That he likes to have the politics, all the things of samsara. And I don't want to see that at all. It's bad enough I ever see the news. That's enough. But what can you do? There's so many people attached to the intellect, the deluded and the ordinary, they may be good people, but they can't go beyond that. And we have to go beyond that if we want to finish this wheel of life. We just have to go beyond it. So let's do a little meditation, just taking us beyond it. I'll give you so many facts. I'm sure your minds must be spinning by the time you finish. So I just want you to breathe in and out. And just bring yourself to this very, very present moment. You're present in this moment. The past doesn't have an iota of tangibility. The future, it could turn out in a million different ways. It's not made. But this moment is the only moment for you to be totally and utterly in touch, aware. you need to in your daily life make a moment of awareness in the midst of your busy daily life just stop for even two minutes sit on your bed sit on the floor sit on a bench and just bring your awareness to this very precious moment And if you look deeply at it, all the miseries of your life start tumbling out. 
your angers, your resentments, your pains, your aches, your illnesses, your dissatisfaction with so many things in your life. You just let it all come tumbling out. And you are bright and aware in this very moment. And as you look, as you watch that misery going out, and it all looks as though it's dark and ugly, then you look deeper and it all dissolves into its essence. It was never you. It was never tangible. It was never a colour. It was never the truth. It was just a passing, fleeting moment or more than a moment in your life you fixated on and you held on to and now for the first time you take the cord holding on to the negative emotion that comes up all the time and you cut the cord he's not a real cord he's not a real feeling he's not a real emotion it's just a Passing, transient, temporary drama that is playing out. Even if you've had that drama for 50 years or 60 years or 70 years or more, that drama is nothing but temporary drama, an experience for your whole life. Let it blow in this very windy day and watch like an old man sitting on a bench, not involved, just watching the perception. And how do we change the coarse, solid, dramas, perceptions, ugly things into pure lands. We first start when we're looking at something in samsara. We start to squeeze our eyes half closed so that we can actually see the non-solidity of whatever we're watching. And we'll see the Vajra chains, those are the awareness that comes out of your body. And then we'll start seeing rainbow light. And out of the rainbow light comes different pure appearances. They are also temporary, transient and go back into the essence. But nevertheless, they are pure lands. Those pure lands are everywhere, inside us, around us. But we are fixated on the deluded, on the ordinary. So we have to step back out of the past, out of the future, into this very precious moment awareness where we realize that those pure lands are right here within us those medicinal pastures those beautiful colored lights the sounds of the insects and the animals and the birds the singing of truth it's all the sound of mantras and mantras are all the beautiful, pure perception of sound. They are the energy to be able to see into the pure land which arose out of the seeds of the book, 
into the deity, the Buddha's land. And there we are, right in the midst of it, in this very, very special moment. And hear the sound as the vo my voice stop. Hear that sound, the buzzing, and listen very deeply to the inner sound. With gratitude rising in your heart, this is all around us, even though we've not been able to perceive it. Practice that, everybody. Practice it. Practice seeing it differently. That's the only way we can see the pure lands and how they really, really are. Okay? Otherwise, we can't see them. Now, when we look at the next few stanzas, we look at the three levels of the lotus palette like palettes. They are outer levels. They are inner levels. They are different ways of responding. They are your three bodies. They are everything in the three levels. And when we understand them, it's so, it's such a beautiful thing. Like Iga in Poland and I, we have discussions because she's a Catholic. And it's so beautiful because it doesn't matter if she's a Catholic, a Buddhist, who cares, you know. It's just to understand these things. If you understand these things in whatever religion you, you follow, it doesn't really matter. My one relative in Israel says, says to me on the phone, you know, Melanie, Muhammad was lived by the sword. That's why the Muslim religion is like that. Now, I just get a vomiting feeling inside me because I do not for one minute believe that Muhammad lived by the sword. I think when Muhammad came to teach the light, just as when Jesus came to teach the light, I think the recipients of this light took it and turned it upside down and made it into what they wanted for their power and their ego and made it a coarse perception. And I really feel sorry for the Muslims. I've met lots of beautiful Muslims who really love their religion and everything, and that's absolutely fine. But they don't believe in the terrorists, that these terrorists say, we are going to, we are we are doing Allah's work, God's work, Muhammad's work, and we are going to rid the rid the planet of, of um, heathens and of people that don't believe. That wasn't what was taught. I mean, how can that ever be taught by any prophet? Anyway, you can't change people's minds about this, unfortunately, but I really don't believe any of these wonderful prophets ever came to teach by the sword. I really, really don't believe that, and I don't think hatred ever exists in the world. But whether you're a Catholic or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Jew or whoever you are, if you understand the three levels of the Lotus Light Palace, it's absolutely amazing because in stanzas 7 to 14, Jigma Lingpa utilizes the three-tiered structure of the palace to introduce us to the three kayas or bodies of Buddha. Doesn't matter what religion you are, please don't think that Buddhists are, are ever pompous about having the truth. I think they can also have distortions of the truth, but I think that what we're looking at here is that the three bodies or kayas 
exist in all people of every religion and existed in Jesus and Mary and, and Muhammad and whoever else, Abraham, I don't know if Abraham was supposed to be a prophet or what, but anyway, whatever, I think that, I think that they existed in every single thing. So the lower, the lowest one is called the extension of the Nirmanakaya of Padmasambhava. And we'll go into it a little bit soon, okay? But that is the lowest level. But it doesn't mean it's a low level. Because if you're in an ordinary body, it can be a low level. But if you're in a near manakaya, the thing is to be able to be there for the sake of all beings so that we can understand that near manakaya. When Buddha Shakyamuni came in a near manakaya, when Jesus came in a near manakaya, Probably Muhammad also came in a near Manakai. They came so that we could understand them with our coarse minds. So they manifest coming from the highest level of Dharmakaya to the next level of Sambhukakaya to the lowest level of near Manakai. But a near Manakai is a totally pure being. Padma Sambhava, when he came, Guru Rinpoche was a near Manakai, the purest of pure. But when you are a near manakaya, you are enlightened. So you have the Sambhokakaya and the Dharmakaya totally developed. You've just given that, not given it up, you've allowed it for you've allowed yourself to show yourself to people. Do you all understand that? So the middle level of the copper colored mountain is the Sambhokakaya will come to the verse, Padmapani, which is an aspect of Chen Rezi. They call it the beatific aspect of Chen Rezi. Beatific means um, bliss, means the beautiful, pure, blissful um, <coughs> aspect of, of um, Chen Rezi. And then the upper level is the Dharmakaya, which is Samantabhadra. Samantabhadra has never got ornaments. He's just a naked body with his, with his consort Samantabhadra because the Dharmakaya doesn't have form. Okay, it doesn't have form. The Dharmakaya is the pure essence, no form. The form comes when the when the when the Dharmakaya emanates the Sambhokakaya so that people who've developed can actually see that pure thing. If you look at the Sambhokakaya, just think of my rainbow colored light. Because all the Sambhokakaya levels are this beautiful rainbow light full of absolute beauty at Sambhokakaya level. But to get there, other than Devachin, you have to have attained like about the 10th level of, of a Buddha. But because of Amitabha saying, it's okay, if they've got devotion, they can get to me. So that's one Sambhokakaya level we can get to, okay? And 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 what the, how, what they call him the copper colored mountain is they don't call him Amitabha they call him Samantabhadra, because Samantabhadra is the naked Buddha. If you want to swap him with Amitabha in your mind, that's fine. Amitabha, Chinrizi, Guru Rinpoche, they are all enlightened beings. They just are able to operate at different level because the Dharmakaya is pure and whole. There's no form there. It's all symbol. It's all essence. It's all beautiful. And if you just look at how we operate inside us in these little physical bodies, we've got the essence, which is our dharmakaya, which we can't really tap into. The essence has got a nature. The nature is purity, clarity, awareness. They, they never separate. That's the Sambhokakaya level. And the Niyamanakaya level is called infinite energy, infinite compassion, which comes into the beings where people can, can relate to them. Now, we have that all the time. And if you look at that, you know, the day I learned that, I learned that in the Zogzen teaching. I don't know if you feel the same way, Corin, but the day I learned about that, essence, nature, unlimited energy of compassion that changed my whole life my whole life because I realized that how you act in this world 
is how much truth you know. Because if you don't know truth, you act good to one person and you hate another person and you hate another nation and you love another nation and you 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 feel angry towards this and you feel jealous towards this that's how we operate as soon as we have changed and cleansed that we now operate in a pure form so when i learned this i said to myself i really want to operate in a near Manakaya form. I want the universe to use me at any time, at any point, at any place to be able to help someone to take their lives and just lift the lid off. I'm shouting at people all the time. Get, I'm, I'm shouting at someone the other day, over and over again. I said to this guy, it's enough with your childhood. It's enough with your pain. It's enough with your wounds. It's enough. I understand somebody that goes on and on and on with that if they don't know there's anything else. Okay? They live their rule, their life according to the rules of their pain and their garbage. But when you know, drop it. Drop it now. Drop it absolutely on the ground it's nothing it'll just go you won't even remember this halfway in the borders you'll be looking at your next life you won't even remember what happened to you so you had a terrible father so you had a terrible mother so you had no money so you had poverty so you had all these wounds so people abused you they did this it's done you're still alive now So the outer descriptions in these verses conform to the instructions on the outer tantras. The inner features correspond to the practices perfected in the inner tantras. Now, you know, in the tantric, in the Vajrayana practice, we've got all the outer tantras. Those are the ones where, for example, you have a lot of description of the deities, of what happens with the deities, of the rules, of the regulations. You have a lot of, you know, a lot of rituals when you do those ones, okay? When you come to the inner tantras, now you're jumping across the river, okay? All of you would have laughed on Saturday because Eckhart came here on Saturday, said, please, Eckhart, please help me come and let me, let me give you all the stuff that I've got such an excess of for the center. I wish one of you would come and take a whole lot of stuff from me. But anyway, pictures and tapes and CDs, and which you can't even really use anymore and everything. He said, you can't throw them away. You can't throw them away. You can't recycle them. We've got to draw them. I said, Eckhart, with pleasure, I'm going to give you a CD center that can play CDs and tapes. And I'm going to give you all these hundreds of tapes and CDs and music. And you've got no idea. And I haven't finished cleaning out the cupboards yet of the, of the CDs and everything. Okay. And he said, you can't get rid of this. You can't get rid of this. You can't get rid of this. This is sacred teaching. This is sacred teaching. And I said, Eckhart, please just take them to the center and just use them. I'll be so happy if you use them. I can't anymore. I've got to unburden myself of this stuff. I've learned what there is to learn from that stuff. All I want now is some of the practices to go onto my computer. And then you can all have them. Because, you know, so that I can use them for that. But, you know, it's like when you come to that level, when you, I said to him like this when I was sitting with him on Saturday afternoon, I said, Eckhart, when you're on this side of the river, okay, and you need to build a boat and you really need to get to the other side of the river, I said, you need everything. As you can see, because when I open my cupboards, never mind my bookshelves, which are full, when I open my cupboards and he saw all these self-help books and everything in, 
And I mean, he's not so well, probably gave him a shock of his life, you know, and I said to him, Eckhart, I've got to get rid of all of this. Because when you, when, when I was teaching, initially I had to study and learn from every single master that there was. I had to learn on the Hinayana level, I had to learn on the Mahayana level. But one day, you actually get to the other side of the river. And then, of course, you don't want to destroy this. You want to give it where people will be able to get stuck. And But I, I said to him, but I don't need this anymore. I just need what I need now. I want to narrow it all down. He came into my shrine room. I said, I'll take some of these pictures, but I can't take the rest. So I said to him, I can't take everything out of, the, out of this house. So you get to a point where you are crossing over, where you don't need any longer every single detail of the teaching. And in these seven verse, in these seven to 14, whatever it is, seven to 15, the long ching ning tick, which is, which is the heart essence teaching. You have a lineage prayer. You invoke the guardians or the, of the Dharma and the lineage masters inside the palace. And then you invoke the protectors. Now, invoked in sharp detail, okay? And what I want you to understand is that I call every morning what I do, and you can do it too with pleasure. See this little red cup here on the end of my thing. This little red cup, every morning, I pour tea in it. Because someone once told me that it's very, very good to give Mahakala and the Dharma protectors tea. So every morning, you can look inside, there's tea inside this, okay? Every day I put it. Then when I put it down on my shrine, I always say to my Dharma protector, please protect all the being, all the people that are coming to me, protect the Dharma, protect our center, let it go out. You need to use something. And then I ask for the Dharma to go everywhere, for all the people that I'm working with to be protected. That's what I do every day. I do all the necessary things that are there. But actually, when you cross, you don't need so much of this anymore. So I keep all my offerings and everything there. <clears throat> and very important in these standards, Jigma Lingpa weaves the secret manner of understanding the Lotus Mansion. We need imagination. The outer pure land turns into a visual narrative for disclosing the continuity of Padma Sambhav wisdom within human experience. And it's recognized as the purity of our own perception. So in other words, in these things, this coded language, when in the next verse, we won't have time to do it today, they talk about the precious eight-petaled lotus. Now, on the palace is the precious eight-petaled lotus. It's the coded language for the center of your subtle body. You've got an eight-petaled lotus right inside your subtle body. And so in there, once you know how to invoke and once you know how to do it, there is the beautiful lotus with Padma Sambhava in the middle. It's you. It's your awakened self. It's in your light body. And so what you've got to do is you've got to, we encourage to engage more deeply with the symbols in the text. That's why if you read this prayer every day, the whole prayer, after you've finished your little practice, whatever you've done, your long practice, if you read it, then you begin to understand the symbols. What does this mean? What does that mean? And then you go, oh my goodness, that's me. It's such an amazing thing because then you know who you are. doesn't matter if people put it down and give you give you a hard time about it, it doesn't matter, because you know what it is and you know who you are. So I tried, honestly, everybody, I really tried to take these verses 
and just do a little paragraph on each one so that we can go through all of them next time of the next lot. And then when we come to the when we come to the meditation, the esoteric meditation, well then I really tried, I really tried not to take too much detail and couldn't help myself. So you'll tell me what you really want and what you really don't want. Because really, really, I think it's so fascinating and I think it's so interesting and I think it's helping me so much. But if you bored or anything with it, you have to tell me. Are you? Can we carry on with it? Okay, because no. Yes, please. Um, can I just add that um, to really appreciate the, um, this prayer and to, to understand it properly, Although you're touching on it, I think mm. you need to read that entire explanation from and, that book. Absolutely. Because without it, I think you're wasting your time, to be quite honest. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. But I've, I've found that, um, as you're saying, the more I actually read about it, the more the more it actually resonates. It's, it's, it's not only resonating, it's, a, it's an understanding of what you're trying to achieve. And I don't know if you can really get that just by reading the prayer. Yeah. No, I don't think you can at all. I can't get it from reading the prayer, truly. And that's why what Karen's offered is to send it on your computer, then you yeah. don't even have yeah. the money to do it. I don't Absolutely. know if you've got to find a way of downloading it for you somehow or order it for you maybe. But you know what? <clears throat> When you've got that and you read the verse, you just go and look there. It doesn't matter if you don't understand everything. I don't even understand everything in the text, okay? But it must be an understanding that starts making you a little bit excited. Do you know what I mean, Bern? Absolutely. You I, 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 yeah. And it, it, it's come all of a sudden. Yep. Initially, when I started, it was, it was, whoa, um, okay, this is now another level. And now suddenly it's, there's, there's, there's definitely um, an understanding and an excitement with it. Exactly. What you're saying is so important for everybody, because in the beginning, it's really difficult. You can't understand it. What do you know? You, I know about my life, Melanie, and what I do every day and how I go about my business. I don't know who I really am. But you suddenly begin to discover that feeling. What I was saying to Eckhart is that looking at all these teachings and all these talks and all this stuff and everything, I just realized who was this person that did all that? I mean, who was she? Melanie isn't the person that did all that. Somehow that happened in my life. And somehow, you know, it wasn't me. There were times when I thought it's me doing it and then I messed up. But as soon as you give up and you give up that it's all me and that's all I am and oh dear, the world is so awful and oh dear, look at my background, look at my family, look at my things. The minute you do that, you've lost it. Your background, your family, your hardships, your losses, your bereavements, your everything are all the things that were made by you. Why? So that you could leave them all behind and bring you to a realization of being an awakened being. Nothing is more important in your whole life, especially as a lot of you are getting older now. It's like so important to understand that all those things were given to you to wake up. So let them be, let them go. So listen, I will I will um, stay for a few minutes if anybody wants to say. Sometimes you don't like saying it on the recording, especially if you know where the recording is going, okay? But I want to... <laughs> I mean, honestly, because Zong Saki and C. Rinpoche was asking, is there any teaching in Africa? I want to go to Africa, he says. I want to go to South Africa. Is there any teaching? So this guy of mine goes, of course there is. <laughs> so he says, I want to see what you're doing. So he sends him 
We sent the people there, part four of this teaching. I mean, I can have a heart attack because, you know, it's not, it's, it's, <laughs> never mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. But let's, but let's dedicate and with pleasure, if anybody wants to ask, I am really here to ask for a bit. So let's dedicate to all sentient beings, especially those caught in the war, especially those that are really having a hard time, especially those bereaved on both sides of the fence and in Ukraine have lost many members of their family. We dedicate, if anything of our merit can be given to them, please let it give them, let it give them comfort, <clears throat> for those hostages, we really pray if there's anything here that can get to them, we pray that it can. And we really pray for all the suffering sentient beings all over the world. And even for those that are trying to dominate others for their own egos. Through this merit, may we achieve all seeing Buddhahood and thereafter, once all harmful enemies have been defeated, may all beings be liberated from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Sonam die tamje zipane tobne ne petranam pamshene jega nachi bala trupaye sipe sole doa doa shu.